All right, well, so I'm, did we get everyone? Okay. So I'm Dan Kelly, and um, I, I really want to thank uh, Sharman and Christina for uh, for doing this on a regular basis and all their all their efforts because uh, I think it's good it's good for everyone. Um, Sharman gave this talk some ridiculous title, so to be or not to be or something. And, uh, I, I shortened, a catchy title, not a ridiculous. I shortened it down. Watch it. And um, it was catchy. Caught my eye. Um, what I thought I'd do is talk a little bit about some of the basic indications for, for surgery. Why would we operate on someone? And then talk about why we wouldn't. And I'm gonna, I'm, then I'm going to focus a little bit on surgical complications because I figure that's something that you all would be kind of interested in. I'll show you a lot of pictures. I'll show you some videos. It may be a little more than you want to see. But um, these are things that we think about, that the surgeons think about, and the, the endocrinologist that sends patients to us think about about whether or not someone should have surgery or should undertake the risk associated with surgery. And so you can see what, what sort of goes through our, through our minds as we, as we uh, do this. So um, pituitary adenomas. Uh, so uh, just, just to get to some of the basics, you know, the, the basic imaging tool we use that I'm sure all of you are aware of and have had is, a, is the MRI. The CT scan is good, but the MRIs are much better and there, there's no radiation. And, and the MRIs really show us pretty clearly these are images looking straight on at the patient. And usually the pituitary adenomas don't enhance as much after the gadolin gadolinium. So here the, the gland is very bright. You can see the pituitary stalk. This is the adenoma here. These are the carotid arteries here. So this is a, a small microadenoma, a medium-sized macroadenoma with the normal gland really squished, and then a very large macroadenoma. This patient happens to have acromegaly as well with the gland here. And so the manifestations for the smaller tumors when they're discovered are usually hormonal excess, such as prolactinomas or acromegaly or Cushing's disease. Then as the tumors get bigger, you can get pituitary failure then visual loss. And many patients get headaches as well with the larger tumors. And so those are the, the problems they cause. <clears throat> and um, the surgery is really to deal with those, with those issues. Um, the goals of the therapy, uh, we want to obviously eliminate the tumor mass as completely as possible. We want to normalize the hypersecretion if there is, say, for someone with acromegaly or, or a prolactinoma. In the process of doing this, we want to try and protect and preserve the normal pituitary gland so that patient has normal pituitary function afterwards and, and we want to eliminate the possibility of a recurrence so that's not always possible. And if you look at the different uh, therapies um, by, by tumor subtype, um, for all of them with the exception of the prolactinoma is really the first line therapy is surgery. So for patients with acromegaly where they're making too much growth hormone, for patients with Cushing's where there's too much ACTH and cortisol, uh, for the non-functional tumors, what we call endocrine inactive tumors, surgery is first-line therapy. For TSH secreting tumors, which cause hyperthyroidism, which are pretty rare, and for tumors that hemorrhage pituitary apoplexy, surgery is the first-line therapy. And it's only for the prolactinomas where we typically now will give Dostinex as a first-line therapy. The old drug is bromocryptine or Parladel. We don't use that very much, but Dostinex is the drug of choice for prolactinomas, although in a number of patients we do operate on the prolactinomas, the small ones because we have a good success rate with the surgery, and some people just don't want to be on the medication. The, the control rate or the cure rate is, is pretty good for the smaller tumors. It's usually around 80 to 90 percent um, for acromegaly, Cushing's, prolactinomas, and even the endocrine inactive tumors. As the tumors get bigger and they get more invasive, the cure rates fall down significantly to around 50% or less. And there's a lot of patients, uh, when we see the MRI, we can see right off the bat that we're not going to cure them. And we have to keep that in mind, whether or not the surgery is worth the risk. So, but some of the, the, nice, the nice thing about the, the successes is that many, many of you that know that have, have had Cushing's disease, for instance, you know, these changes occur, but these changes can, can resolve with the treatment when the tumor's out. And, that, and that's really uh, a big reason why uh, we, we do the surgery. Not only the body habitus changes, but the hypertension, the diabetes, the osteoporosis. 
and even the hair changes. And I just got this letter from a patient. I blocked out the name because I don't want to have any HIPAA violations here, but I just thought I'd read this to you. It says, Dear Dr. Dan, I've sent you a piece of my hair. The brown part, it's down here, it's taped to this letter right here. It says, The brown part is from the scalp side. True, and had to let you know. It was pulled out on 62206 and has just been sitting on my bathroom vanity. There are others, but I don't but I really don't pull out gray hair, so no analysis on that. However, if this one is one and a half inches in brown hair from the scalp, that means that the reversal didn't start until after I was completely off the prednisone. Assuming hair grows one-third of an inch per month, I think that's generous. My operation was October 26, 2004, and on October 26, 2005, I was off prednisone. It took a year. My hair is also thicker and is issuing its own oils again. So is my skin. My weight is stable at 120 to 125. Thanks. Life is good. Want to go to the beach? <laughs> and uh, and but actually, you can see this, and there is a change in her hair here. Uh, it gets notably thicker. And when we looked at the hair, it wasn't was indeed thicker. And and that's what we hear from some other Cushing's patients. So, you know, Cushing's disease. Uh, for those of you that have had it or still have it, know that it's a very um, debilitating disease, not just from the body habitus changes, but the hypertension, the diabetes, bone changes, all sorts of things. And so um, this is the part of the reason why we, we obviously want to reverse these sorts of things, try and make people feel better. If someone wants to interrupt along the way, feel, feel free to. So what about the, the approach? How do we go about removing most of these tumors now? Well, there the, the classic approach, uh, the, the, the approach that we use for all these is what's called a transphenoidal approach. It's through the sphenoid sinus. Uh, it's through what's called this piriform aperture, this opening in the skull here. And the, the traditional approach is the sublabial route under the lip, which is a very good midline approach. We stopped using that about eight years ago when we do this direct endonasal approach, which uh, most of you in the room here, many of you have, have had. Um, and it avoids a lot of the mucosal dissection and the incision under the lip, and it's, it's really much better tolerated and really provides us with the same exposure. Um, there's much more use of the endoscope now, which we use frequently on, on cases, uh, and then there's some other approaches which aren't really much too different from the sublabial and aren't really, are being used less and less, I think. And so this approach is, is really a fairly straightforward approach. If you draw a line from the nostril to the cella, where the pituitary gland is, you pass a structure called the middle turbinate. These are these bony uh, structures within the nasal cavity on the outside, lateral to the septum, and they're covered with mucosa. And if you draw a line from there to there, you pass this one called the middle turbinate. There's a superior and inferior in the middle, and that's a landmark that we use and helps us go in the, in the right direction. And it's a very simple approach because it only involves one, one mucosal dissection at the back of the, uh, one mucosal incision at the back of the nasal cavity. And then we remove bone to get into the sphenoid sinus. And this just shows um, this approach schematically with the speculum here. How we start, we make a mucosal incision here. We push the septum off the midline. And then we put a, a, a different speculum in the nose. Uh, and that gives us the exposure to the, to the pituitary gland. And one of the advantages of doing this is that the patients recover uh, in, a, in a much better fashion than they do with the sublabial approach. And this is a paper we just, we just published earlier this year. Uh, many of you might have participated in this survey uh, where we surveyed patients in terms of, their, uh, in terms of new headache, facial pain, nasal congestion, decreased airflow, decreased sense of smell, and lip numbness. And basically what you can see in, the, in these patients, this is at three months or more after surgery, that, that really about uh, 80 to 90 percent of the patients overall had no complaints or only, only mild complaints. Um, this is none, mild, moderate, and severe. And so it's an operation that's pretty well tolerated. And when we compared it with patients who had had a prior sublabial operation, because we had about 30 of those patients who had a reoperation, the the endonasal operation uh, was uh, better in terms of uh, an easier recovery, less pain, and, and better nasal airflow. So, so overall, it seems like this is a much better way to go. When, whether you do it purely endoscopically or whether you do it endonasally with the operating microscope, which is the way I do most of them, 
I don't think it makes too much difference. Okay, so why not? Why not have an operation? Well, I'm going to list a few, a few things here. Um, first of all, you may not have a tumor. I see a patient at least once a week, or I see an MRI where a patient comes to my office, the MRI, come, MRI, MRI report comes to the office, and the patient has a diagnosis of pituitary tumor. But when we look at the scan, we don't see any tumor. And the hormonal studies are normal. And, and there's a, a number of patients out there getting operations who don't need an operation because really they don't have a tumor and it's a misread on the MRI. Um, or the tumor may be present but it's causing no problem. Uh, if you look at studies done on the general population, if you scan 100 patients, do a high quality pituitary MRI on 100 patients off the street, about 20 of them are going to have something in their pituitary gland that's abnormal looking. And it might be a small little adenoma, it might be a small cyst, but in the vast majority of those patients, it is probably doing nothing to the patient. It's cohabitating with the patient without any problem at all and should be left alone. So we see a lot of those, these what are called incidental omas. Uh, maybe the medical therapy is better, like I said, for prolactinomas. You know, you, you take, the, take the pill once or twice a week and the tumor shrinks down and menstrual periods resume or libido improves and... Um, has none of the risk of associated with surgery. Or radiotherapy is better. In some patients who have already had surgery, uh, who someone who can't be cured with additional surgery, we say that, uh, hello, Charmin, I think she, <laughs> Charmin, she made it. Um, so in, we, there, I don't think there's really ever an, an indication anymore where we would say that radiotherapy would be considered first-line treatment. I mean, usually we would do some sort of uh, transphenoidal debulking, um, but it's in patients who have residual tumor or recurrent tumor where the tumor is in an area in the cavernous sinus, for instance, out around the carotid arteries where we can't get the tumor, where it would be better to, to give radiation than try another operation. In some instances, it's the wrong diagnosis. We see a lot of patients who come to us with what they think is Cushing's disease. And I can tell you that it's a very difficult diagnosis to make. And there's a lot of patients that we see who, who don't have Cushing's disease and shouldn't have surgery. Um, and so uh, that's the most common wrong diagnosis that we see uh, is, is, is Cushing's disease. And, and, I, and I, I have to attribute some of it to to our support group and our work with Sharman because she's made such an um, impact, I think, in terms of alerting the world to Cushing's disease that, that everyone, that many people now who you know, may have some hypertension or diabetes, obesity, um, they attribute it to Cushing's disease and without an appropriate workup. So a small percentage of those people will have Cushing's disease. Um, but the, the diagnosis really has to be confirmed with the biochemical studies. It's not based on the MRI. It has nothing to do with the MRI findings. A third of the patients with Cushing's disease uh, don't have a pituitary tumor uh, seen uh, visible on their MRI. And so this is really important to, to consider before we make a decision about, about going, going in. Um, why not? And also maybe it's the wrong surgeon. And, um, <laughs> You know, I'm certainly not perfect, and we have complications that I'll talk about. But um, in general, if you're con contemplating surgery, you want to go to someone or someplace where this is a regular operation that's done on a routine basis with a fairly high volume. Dr. Kelly? On uh, uh, Dr. Lewis, uh, Kelly, uh, explained to me in Marsha's situation that a lot of the uh, MRI never see the tumor, but it is, in fact, there. And in her case, in surgery, they did see a, a mass once they got in there. And in fact, Dr. Lou thought he saw it anyway before they did the surgery. Mm -hmm. But as a surgeon, I'm trying to put myself in the place of a surgeon. What is it you have? To, what are you looking for if you're going in and you? Is there a visible well, indication? Well, in the in the patients with with Cushing's disease with a normal MRI. Um, sometimes the normal is not quite so normal. So there may be some very subtle findings on the MRI that we think, well, that, that's, that may be where it is, and that might be the first place we go. That's exactly the, what was her 
and that's often the case. And 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 you go in and you hope you're you hope you're right. Um, the other there are some additional scans we do now. What's called a dynamic MRI that we do, which does very thin slices um, after the gadolinium is administered, and that helps pick up some more that we used to not see. And then some patients have petrosal sinus sampling. I don't know if she had that. If there's a very big gradient from side to side, that can be helpful, but it can also be completely wrong. It's almost like flipping a coin. So we don't put too much faith in the side to side gradient. We look more at the peripheral, the peripheral ACTH values to the central. Um, and so, so these are these are. These are tough cases. If you don't have any of that, um, you, what we do is we go in, we do a wide opening, we expose the whole gland from the front, and then we start slicing, making slices into the gland and sending off specimens. And uh, we, we will explore the outside of the gland to see if there's any obvious tumor on the outside. But if that's completely normal, if you're all just looking at normal gland, then you have to start sectioning the gland. And you can do that with, you know, with, without causing new pituitary failure, provided you don't take too much of the gland. And so um, those are very, they're, they're tough cases. I and mean, these are the toughest, some of the toughest cases. The smallest tumors can be the toughest cases by far um, because they, they're hard to find and, and their the cure rate is definitely lower. Thank you, Is being hypopituitary a reason not to do surgery? Uh, hypopituitary from what cause? From pituitary. No. Mm -mm. I mean, in general, with pituitary failure, and I'll talk about this a little more. If, if um, what I typically tell patients is that, uh, in terms of the gland function, about 75% of the patients, what you have going in is what you're going to come out with. So, if you have a, a deficit, it's not going to change in the majority of cases. Uh, in about 20% of the cases, it will get better. In about 5% of the cases, there might be some new pituitary failure. So. Um, but as long as you're replaced, you know, on the key hormones, as long as you have adequate steroid glucocorticoid replacement and you have thyroid replacement, the operation is, is, is safe, you know. So what, what about complications? You know, I, I'm actually on a, a committee now with, within neurosurgery. We're, we're actually writing up uh, some treatment guidelines for pituitary tumors. Um, treatment standards, and one of the things we're looking at is at, at, at complications and how to uh, and complication avoidance. And um, so, th you know, this is something that all surgeons, you know, hate to deal with, but but they're 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 very real. It, it's part of the the risks of the of of what we do and what we expose our patients to. And um, this is a paper that was published almost 10 years ago by Ivan Cherik, who's a neurosurgeon in Chicago. He's just about retired now, I think. He's still pretty busy. And he did a survey of neurosurgeons um, and asked them to say, what kind, have you ever had any of these complications before? And if you have, how often have you had them out of however many cases, however many transplantal cases you've done? And you can see that, you know, Thank goodness the, the, the death rate, the carotid artery injury rate is around 1%. I mean, that's still not insignificant, particularly if you're in this 1%. Um, CNS injury means some sort of brain injury. Ophthalmoplegia means your eyes don't move properly. You have double vision afterwards, meningitis, loss of vision, a blood clot, hematoma, spinal fluid leak, which is one of the more common ones, 4%. Perforation of the septum. This is really, we just don't see this anymore with this new endonasal approach that we do. Diabetes insipidus, this seems pretty high, which is damage to the posterior pituitary lobe. And anterior pituitary failure, 19%, that seems pretty high. Now, these numbers are a bit old. And you have to also remember that these are, you're asking the surgeon to remember what his or her complication rate were. And so it's, there's some bias there. Um, <laughs> But in general, when you look at large series, the, you know, the, the mortality rate for this operation should be under 1%, okay? Carotid artery injury should be under 1%. Um, and a lot of these things go down with, with increasing experience. So I'm going to take you through some of these just so you can see what, what uh, sort of problems you can, you, we can get into. 
this is our series since we started doing the Indonesial approach. Uh, this is goes up to January. We're now, I don't know, somewhere around 650 patients or so. But the numbers are pretty much stable in terms of the majority of what we operate on through the nose are pituitary adenomas then something called Rathke's cleft cysts, which is a cyst that forms between the anterior and posterior lobe. They're not a real tumor. Cranial pharyngiomas are very difficult tumors to cure because they get wrapped around everything. Chordomas are a skull-based tumor, and they're meningiomas, other sorts of brain tumors. A lot of these tumors now are tumors that traditionally we would have taken out with a craniotomy, but now we're doing a lot of it through the nose because we've, we just have better equipment and we've, we've got greater experience and confidence about repairing the defects that we create in the skull base, essentially doing a craniotomy through the nose. And th this is our, our complication rate, uh, my complication rate in these first 558 patients. Uh, one patient died. Uh, this was an elderly gentleman in his 80s with a, quite a large tumor, and he had a hemorrhage afterward, and we went back in and we operated on him, and he had a long, stormy course in the intensive care unit and ultimately died. Um, but that's pretty low, fortunately. We had one... Our, uh, anterior cerebral artery infarction, I'm really unclear why that happened. We had three carotid artery injuries early on. Uh, haven't had any for a long time in the pituitary tumor since we've been using this Doppler probe, and I'll show you that. Had three permanent neurologic deficits. Uh, these are patients all with, with some degree of visual loss, most of them mild, and they all had pre-existing visual loss so that the visual the optic nerves were already somewhat compromised. Three cases of meningitis. We've had uh, five hematomas. These have all been very big tumors, usually over four or five centimeters. You know, so these are these are very large tumors. Um, and then CSF leaks, uh, three percent rate of that. It's a little lower now. Um, and then a few other things, not so much related to the intracranial stuff. Um, so. You know, but if you add it all up, major morbidity, mortality comes up to 6%, you know. So it's not a, it's not a totally um, risk-free operation. A lot of these things are, you know, things that people recover from very quickly. The meningitis are all full recoveries. The hematomas, no one had permanent visual loss. They all did well. All these CSF leaks were sealed up. So most of these things are things that people went through, but they ended up doing very well. I mean, obviously the patient uh, who died didn't this person with the infarction, but everyone else, all the carotid artery injuries, all these other patients did well with the exception of these patients who lost some vision. Um, and these were actually not pituitary adenomas. In fact, none of these were pituitary adenomas. They were different types of tumors. What does the carotid artery have to do with the pituitary? I'll show you. The carotid artery runs right <laughs> along the pituitary gland. So these are some of the things we like to try and avoid. You know, um, first the diagnostic error, um, not getting to the right place, misguided trajectory, complications of the nose, then these things that I that I just talked about. So we'll we'll talk about some of these things. So diagnostic errors, like I said. Um, we see a lot of patients who are diagnosed with a pituitary tumor who, in fact, don't have a pituitary tumor. They don't have a well-defined lesion like this. Um, and, and so we, we look at a lot of these MRIs, and, and I often disagree, uh, not often, sometimes disagree with what other radiologists think. And as I said, some people will have abnormalities, but given that their hormonal studies are all normal and they're, maybe they're, they have a tiny little 2 or 3 millimeter lesion tumor in their pituitary gland, they're having terrible headaches. Well, chances are the headaches have nothing to do with that, and that's not someone that we would want to offer an operation to. One of, one of the uh, important things to consider anytime we see a large lesion, large tumor like this in the skull base, uh, is to always, particularly in men, is to always check a prolactin level because prolactinomas in men can be uh, can look like this. And the normal prolactin level is usually less than 20. And in most of these, this is one patient here. These are two different patients. The prolactin can be over 5,000 or 10,000. So we always check a prolactin level with these. 
And in this particular patient here, this patient had a craniotomy at an outside hospital. They never checked a prolactin level, and they got in and found out it was a prolactinoma. Um, and he, he came to us, and we actually did operate on him through the nose because he had this hemorrhagic cyst compressing his brainstem. You see how his brainstem is really contorted and distorted by this? And we figured that even with the therapy, it wouldn't go down. But look what happened to his prolactin level. His prolactin level was over 5,000, and he was put on, uh, he was actually put on bromocryptine, I think, and he his prolactin level went down, and look at how the tumor just melted away. Because we didn't take much of the tumor out. The tumor just melted away. And so that's a person who, you know, could have avoided a craniotomy if the appropriate tests had been obtained at the, at the outset. This is a patient that um, was operated on initially elsewhere. It was thought to be a pituitary tumor. And... Um, this tissue was taken out here, and the, it was, the surgeon was told by the pathologist that this was a pituitary adenoma. Well, in fact, it was the pituitary gland, and this was actually a meningioma. And so, um, and this doesn't really look like a pituitary adenoma. This, this has a specific look to it that um, once you've seen a lot of them, you can distinguish in most cases between a meningioma and a pituitary adenoma, not always. But these are some of the pitfalls that, that as surgeons, we have to be aware of and, and try, try and avoid because in this particular case, this was where the gland was, and, and this person doesn't have much pituitary function now, is on, is on pituitary hormone replacement. Well, what about this case? This is a, a really interesting case. Um, this is a... A 22-year-old woman who had fatigue, headaches, she had some milky discharge from her breast, and her prolactin level was very high. And she got an MRI, and her prolactin level was 100 and, almost 140. As I said, normal is less than 20. And she has this pretty large mass here. Well, an astute uh, endocrinologist who I worked with happened to check her, her thyroid function and found out that her that she actually had hypothyroidism. And this is an example of what we call primary hypothyroidism. And so with two months of Synthroid, her pituitary gland just shrunk down to a normal size. So what happens is that when the thyroid isn't functioning well, the pituitary gland compensates and it gets very big with hypertrophies. So what looked like to be a tumor is actually not a tumor. It's just a big, swollen up, hypertrophied pituitary gland. And one of the tip-offs is that the gland looks, it looks very homogenous. You don't see what we call differential enhancement. You know, on those other images I showed you, there's little areas where it does not as much enhancement. And so this is, this is just the normal gland being very big and working very hard. And when you gave the patient Synthroid, it went back to a normal size. And so this is another pitfall where patients like this have been operated on and, you know, uh, the normal gland. Your TSH was extremely high, right, in that case? Yeah. So the, the TSH was extremely high, over 1,500. Normal is less than 5. So the pituitary gland was pumping out all this TSH, and that's why it was so hypertrophy. And then, so... You decide to operate on someone, well, then there, there's what we would call errant trajectories, going off too high, too low, or too lateral. And we have ways of trying to, to uh, avoid that. So that would be too high, too low, too lateral. This is, you asked about the carotid artery. So if this is a, this is a cross-sectional drawing here. This is a sphenoid sinus. Here's the nasal speculum in the patient. This is the pituitary gland. This is a pituitary tumor. Carotid arteries run on either side, right up against the pituitary gland and up against the pituitary tumor. So it's something we have to be aware of every time we do a case. The most common cause of, a, of an error trajectory is usually omission of image guidance. So we always use the fluoroscopy or we use some sort of surgery, computerized surgical navigation. And this is a patient where... Uh, they didn't use surgical navigation, and they thought they were going into the cella, 
but the cell is up here. They they thought they were in the root. They thought they were up here, and they went in. They opened the dura and they biopsied the brainstem. And uh, patient had a little bit of a stroke, but she ended up making a pretty good recovery. Um, but these are some of the the basic things that 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 can happen. They don't happen very often. Um, but but they, they can happen. And so what we typically do is we use the, the fluoroscope like this, which is just gives you essentially an x-ray, and it tells you exactly where you are. There's the cella there. There's the speculum in place. So then we look for some, we look for some landmarks. When we go in, we want to look for this structure called the middle turbinate, which is, as I said, leads us back to, to the... Um, to the entry into the into the sphenoid sinus. This is this handheld speculum here, <coughs> and we're gonna we're gonna slide past that. This is the actual approach. We we cauterize the nasal mucosa, and then we make an incision. So this is way in the back of the nasal cavity here, and we expose the bone, and then we put this other speculum in to to work through, and then we make a wide opening. There's two natural openings: the sphenoid ostea that lead into the sphenoid sinus and we basically create them we create one large opening so to work through. What's the diameter of this stuff cavity? Well the working channel is about this big. I mean you know how big your nostril is. It stretches a bit but you know <laughs> and it flares out. The speculum flares out a little bit inside. Each inch and a half. Yeah not even that not even that much. Inside it's about an inch, inch and a half. So this is what a typical adenoma looks like. We're removing it here. Um, they're usually very soft like this. They're usually pretty easy to distinguish from the normal pituitary gland. This was rather large though, right? This was a very, this was a large one. You see this at the screen at the same time, right? Well, we're looking in the microscope. So we're seeing down, the, right. we're looking straight down. When you use the endoscope, you have the scope inside the patient's nose and you're looking up at a screen. And you're looking direct into the microscope. Yeah, but within when we use the endoscope, we're not. We're looking up. We're looking up at the screen here. And I'll show you some pictures with the endoscope too. So this is showing the the herniation of the of the um, di what we call the diaphragmacella coming down when it, when we take the tumor out, a big tumor, and it collapses down. It takes about two hours on average, two to three. You know, it depends on the tumor, it depends on, on a lot of things, but on average, the actual surgical time is about two hours. And then this is just putting that turbinate back. What was that mesh? That was, I was gonna say, when explain Well, the mesh, is, the mesh is when we get a spinal fluid leak and we wanna repair the floor. The, the bony floor of the cella is removed, okay? And, and so, um, if, and then we open the dura, and then if we get, often that membrane that separates the pituitary gland from the rest of the brain is very thinned out. And when we take the tumor out, it's like uncorking a bottle. And if you have a spinal fluid leak, it has to be fixed. So one of the basic principles of fixing that is to use some sort of buttress. So we use some, some sort of material that forms a watertight barrier. We typically use collagen, a synthetic collagen. If it's a bigger leak, we use that plus abdominal fat. And then we use the mesh as a buttress. In the in the old days, when we did it under the under the lip, we would harvest some of the nasal septum, but we don't take any of the septum now. And so we use this titanium. Other people use silastic things. There's some. There's other sorts of absorbable plates. I happen to like the mesh because it's very malleable. You can cut it with scissors and make it just the right size. But that's only there's a CSF. Thing. Yeah. Once in a while, if the, if the diaphragmacella herniates out in a big way where we're worried about a leak developing, we'll put it in as well just to, just to protect the, the inside. So this is just some more of the surgical technique about making sure we're staying in the midline. Uh, avoidance of rhinological complaints, so the nasal complaints. If you look at the older literature, uh, I already talked about this uh, with our, the approach that we use now. This nasal septal perforation really doesn't occur now. Upper <coughs> lip numbness is extremely rare. We still see one, a few patients here and there who lose their sense of smell. 
And unfortunately, you know, it doesn't seem like much, but it's a really, um, people are really upset by it. And it, it upsets me, and I don't, when it happens, we, we usually don't, we have no idea why it happened. Dr. Kelly, did they lose the sense of taste as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Totally yeah. or just fresh? It, sometimes it's complete, sometimes it's partial, and, and uh, but it, you know, when they come back in to see us, they always mention it. Okay. And they're, you know, it's... If you remember, so I had something rather strange that you hadn't come across before. But um, my first meal after my surgery it just tasted so incredibly sweet. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was. Did anybody else have that? Yeah, mm -hmm. I smelled cinnamon buns for two weeks. Oh, <laughs> was, it was, I had a heightened <laughs> sense of smell. Like everything was so. I could smell everything in my mouth. I couldn't stand the smell of anything because it all. I could taste it in my mouth so strong that everything made me sick. I was convinced that the melon they gave me in the hospital was, was pure sugar. Sugar, yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah, it's really bizarre. It's sour down that, but my taste is a lot more heightened than it was. Me too. My taste is so heightened that a lot of I can't eat a lot of the same foods anymore. <laughs> and the smell, any smell, it just sends me practically over the edge if I can't. Even still, to this day. Mm -hmm. How long did you have the surgery? It was six years ago. And you still have it today? Mm -hmm. Not as bad as right after surgery, but and which most people lose their sense of smell. Mine was, ex I couldn't even stand the smell of my flowers in my room. Couldn't, I couldn't stand the smell of the salt water, and I'm like four hmm. miles from the ocean. Oh, it might be, it might it be something mouth. with the Cushing's patients. I, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Just a hunch. Just a hunch. Yeah. So you don't like the smell of flowers? No, I do now, but right after surgery, I, I couldn't, I couldn't even be in the room with them because mm -hmm. they, if I would taste it in my mouth, the smell was so strong. I did lose my sense of smell after surgery, and I'm just wondering what your experience is about it coming back. How far out are you now? Four and a half months. And it, I get I get little, every now and then I can smell a little something. Yeah. But most of the time now, I'm darling, there's no fun anymore. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, I can shoot a fishing station. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't, generally, it comes back within a few weeks. I typically tell people, you're going to, you may not smell much for the first two or three weeks after surgery or a week or two and then it comes back. If it's going much beyond, you know, six months, uh, I'd say it's it's not not likely, but it, it may. Once in a while it does. So I, I wouldn't... I've, I've heard different stories from different I wouldn't give up. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you. But anyway... People don't like it, right? It's oh, it's no. a it's a real disappointment. But we live Who in the forest that? too. If there's a fire, I've had to have the neighbors come over and tell Marcia if they're Oh, really? Yeah. Did you have a taste? Did I have a, a nerve? Or it seems when I take a drink of a cold glass of water, or whatever, there, there's a sensation that goes up my nose. Hmm. Is there? It might be. Some people, I don't know if anyone in the room had this, they get a little patch of numbness behind their two front teeth. Yeah, I had that. And usually over time, it sort of shrinks down and goes away, completely resolves. Um, you know, that, that speculum sits in that, what we call the piriform aperture, that bony opening into the face of the, the skull. And it can depending upon where it sits, and we don't see the nerves, you know, they're under the, they're under the skin and the mucosa, so if it sits in a certain way, it can probably contuse or bruise the nerve, and it may then cause the numbness or then cause some sort of funny firings a after that. What didn't but, happen after surgery? It was my daughter's four, and she left me in the nose by accident, and it seemed to loosen something hmm. up. And after that, I could feel it. So I don't know if... I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I, you know, it, it'll probably get better. Yeah, that's what my doctor said. If she doesn't hit you again. Dr. Collier, who going to explain to you um, the difference why you don't use packing anymore? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Well, the, the thing with packing is that when the old way of doing it with the sublabial approach, there were what we called three mucosal tunnels. So they made, we made, I did a bunch of these where we make a, you make a mucosal tunnel on the floor of the nasal cavity on either side, and then you make a long one along the nasal septum. So you have these three big flaps of mucosa that you elevate up, and you're working in what's called the submucosal space, so you're right up against the bone. And the reason why people pack the nose is because <clears throat> if, you don't pack the, if you don't push the mucosa back down up against the septal cartilage and the bone, 
there's always a lot of oozing from the mucosa. The mucosa is very vascular, and you can get a septal hematoma. So you can get a blood clot between the mucosa and the septum, and it can cause necrosis of, or death of the cartilage. So it can cause a, a, a perforation of the cartilage. And, you know, you can just get a lot of nasal bleeding. So that approach needs nasal packing to push, to push the mucosa back down. When we do it this way with only one incision at the back of the nasal cavity, there's no mucosal elevation, and so there's just no need for the packing. We, we, packed, we did the packing for quite a, quite a few of the people, on the initial people, for about the first 70 or 80 patients that we did this endonasal approach on. And when we did the survey of them, and, we, and uh, I think you participated in that survey, um, if we, we asked about what were their major complaints acutely and while they were in the hospital, it was nasal packing, nasal packing, nasal packing, because it's very uncomfortable. It's a big wad of packing up each nostril, and we would leave it in for a day or two. And uh, it was the nasal packing, the mouth breathing, and removing the packing, very unpleasant. So we don't do it anymore. And you, you, there's no reason to do it. And the people that do it endoscopically, uh, I don't think they pack the nose much anymore either. Yeah, a lot of them still do. I guess they do a little bit. but So th this is, again, just showing um, showing this this approach. Oh, you've, you've seen all this. Well, let's see here. Um, one of the things... Go ahead. I actually removed it. Out or the tumor. Out or, yeah. The tumors are usually really are are quite soft, and um, we scoop them out. I'll show you. I'll, I, I think I may have a video of that. But the, we use these what are called ring curettes. They're sharp on the inside and they're smooth on the outside, so they're very safe up against the normal gland, up against the carotid artery, and they scoop the tumor. They loosen the tumor up, and then we grab it with some instruments or with suction. Once in a while, the tumors are more firm or rubbery, and there we need to cut them out. And um, uh, they're a little more difficult to take out, but about 80% of the, of the pituitary adenomas are quite soft, and they're very easy to take out, and they're very easy to distinguish from the normal gland. Um, this is just a speculum that we developed that allows you to slide the... Slide the the main speculum in. This is what we call the self-retaining speculum in. This thing pops apart. It's just a little way to protect the mucosa, and so it makes the makes it all a little bit easier. I'll show you. So this is the same same approach going through the right nostril here, and then once we get that bone exposed at the back of the nasal cavity, we slide this speculum in over this one, and then we pull the pin out on this so that the two halves of the other speculum fall apart. And so it's just like a protective sleeve. And uh, it just makes the recovery a little bit easier, a little less bleeding. Um, Dr. Kenny, why do you um, use the right nostril or the left nostril? Is that the position of the tumor itself? It depends entirely where the tumor is. As we don't pay too much attention to the nasal anatomy. It's all where the tumor is. In general, if the tumor is more off to the right, we come from the left nostril and vice versa. And that's because the nasal septum gives more than does the, the turbinates. So when you put the speculum in, if this is the one along the septum, it, it tends to bow over more so you get very good exposure across the midline. And that's, that's how we do it. Um, Carotid artery injuries, I don't want to scare you with all this, and I'll just move along. Just to suffice it to say that the carotid arteries are very close, you know, very much in, right in the region of where we're operating. These dark circles are the carotids here. This is a big tumor with hemorrhage in it. Here you can see the pituitary stalk, the gland. Um, this is an uh, interesting photograph here. You can see all the vasculature. These are the optic nerves, and these are the carotid arteries right here. And here's another example. This is a patient with what's called a Rathke's cleft cyst. Pituitary gland is normal size, so the carotids are pretty close together, right there and there. So, you know, you're really close. So we, we use the Doppler on every single case now. And it's just be, just what I said. The, the, the advantage of... So if the tumor and this tumor is going more to the, to the left, we come from the right nostril. So we get better exposure over here, but we also get better exposure of the 
carotid artery in that side, and you have to be aware of that because you can open right up onto it. Is mm. that hereditary, Dr. Kelly, at all? Is what? The carotid artery, since my mother had it. She had what, a rupture of the carotid artery? Or? She had a carotid artery. Well, everyone has a carotid artery. Everyone has oh, two of them. I don't know. No, there are two. There's there's two carotid arteries and there's two uh, vertebral arteries that supply the brain with blood. It was something by her ear. That was like well, everyone has a carotid artery, and everyone everyone has two that run well, right she along had the surgery. vertebral. So maybe she had a. She probably had some stenosis, and maybe had a carotid endarterectomy. So. I just wanted to know if it was hereditary. In a sense, yes, it's hereditary. Because <laughs> everyone, everyone gets gets two of them. <laughs> no, I don't. The carotid stenosis is. I don't know if it's hereditary. It can be. Yeah, atherosclerosis, those sorts of things can be, but it's often you know diet that sort of thing. Um. So, we had two in our first 114 procedures. Unfortunately, no one died or even had a stroke. Um, and since that time, we've had one in over 500 procedures. Uh, and this was in a patient with a, with a skull-based tumor. It wasn't really a pituitary adenoma. So we use the Doppler on all these cases. And um, it's very helpful. And we use some specialized blades. Oh, I don't think I have the volume turned up here. Hang on, let me just do something here for a second. Do you want to hear the Doppler, what it sounds like? Sure. Yeah. Okay, let me hang on one second here. Let me just turn up the volume. Where is it? Well, yep, that's what you're going to hear. It's a Doppler going right up along right here. So what is that doing for you? It tells us where not to put the knife. <laughs> How does the sound do that? Well, here, let me show you here. So, so here we've taken all the bone away. We've taken the bone away, right, from, from, and now we're looking at the dura. This is what we're seeing under the microscope. So the carotid is just out under this bone edge. And then this one, this, this one's closer because we're coming from the right nostril. This one is really more probably exposed right up here. So if we put the blade in right here, we can get the carotid. Uh, and looking. We just want to know exactly where exactly where it is. He's like mapping it. Yeah, we're just mapping it out. So is it amplify the blood flow or what does it do that sound? <laughs> it's just a Doppler, you know, it emits the little sound waves and it bounces well, back and it's blood flows. Yeah, the, 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 the flowing blood of the carotid. I mean you can see what the carotid does, it's a very complex anatomy in what's called the cavernous sinus. The carotid comes, you know, your carotid arteries you can feel right here, right? They're pumping away. And there's an external and an internal. So the internal carotid artery goes up through the skull base and it travels forward and it comes like this. And if we're looking straight on at the patient, these are the optic nerves, you're looking straight on at the patient. The carotids come up like this and they make a 180 degree turn. And that turn is right on either side of the pituitary gland. So the carotids go like this, and the gland is right here. And so when we, uh, when we do this operation, if we go too far to one side and we open, because we, we have to open the dura with a very sharp blade, and sometimes the carotids can be right under that same dura. You can't see the transition between, between the, the cellar, what we call the cellar dura, where the gland sits, and the cavernous sinus. And so you can put the blade right in the carotid. I mean, there are surgeons that don't use the Doppler, and that's, it, it, it's scary, because they, they can't always tell where the... 
you know, I I don't go home, don't leave home without it anymore. <laughs> so the way, so then the way we do the opening, once we map out where it is, you know, we do this initial opening with the with the blade, with the straight blade, and then we use these hook blades to do the lateral opening. And and so what we this is what this is what I'm talking about. We want to avoid this. So this is. This is an article we just wrote on the use of the of the Doppler, and we use these very small blades. We used to use these big blades, which got in our way of seeing what we're doing. These smaller blades are much much more low profile, and we can see around them better. And so this is an example of uh, using the hook blade here to open the to open the dura there, and then we fold the dura up. And you can see how soft that that's how that's soft the tumor. the tumor is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. soft. What size is that the one you're looking at? That one is probably uh, less than a centimeter. Uh, this was a prolactinoma, I think. That's normal gland. You see how orange the gland looks, kind of red. And here we're feeling out along carotid arteries right in there, but these ring curettes are very, very safe. You can't really hurt the carotid with the with the ring curettes. They're they're very soft on the outside. So. I remember my mother's doctor telling her that her surgery was very, very dangerous. Hmm. Of her carotid. Right. Yeah. I don't like the carotid. <laughs> um, okay, so then what, what about, you know, subtotal tumor removal? It's not really considered a complication, but it's a suboptimal outcome. Um, we like to we like to avoid that as much as possible, and we we actually went back and looked because we we do a lot of reoperations and, and we looked at our the, the reoperations in a particular type of tumors the endocrine inactive tumors. It's a paper we just published not too long ago, and we we looked at 30 patients who had had repeat operations for one of these tumors. And I, what I kept seeing was that when we go in, that the, the prior operation had had a very inadequate uh, opening. It had a small opening, either through the through the keel of the sphenoid, that sphenoid bone at the back of the nasal cavity, or the opening to the cella where the gland sits. And of these 30 patients, three were my own patients, so uh, from six to nine years ago. So it shows that there's definitely a, a learning curve. But what we found is that when we when we looked at all this, that Every single patient out of the 30 had a sub had a suboptimal opening, either at the keel or the cella or both, in 90%. And so that really makes it difficult to do an adequate tumor removal if you don't do a big enough opening. And Dr. Kelly, would you say on any of those were they just total um, endoscopic or were those microscopic endoscopic? They were they were all uh, microscopic, as far as I know. Most of them were sublabia, which is a bigger exposure. Uh, which, which, in general, provides you bigger anatomical exposure. Which, which, one of the points we tried to make uh, diplomatically in the paper was that you know it, it's, um, in general, this is a it's a it's a lack of experience, and and this is these are some examples. So here's this is what's called the sphenoid ostium, sphenoid ostium, uh, ostium here. And this was the sphenoidotomy that they did. With. So typically what we do, these two ostia at the, at the midline, at the back of the nasal cavity, you want to remove all of this, all of this bone. So these two small openings become one big open. But what we would typically see in these cases is that the openings were like this or like this. And that's an example of one, an actual intraoperative photograph of one. It becomes very hard to do an adequate tumor removal when you have such a small opening. Here's an example of a, of a patient who we reoperated on that had this residual tumor. And this was the prior opening in the bone of the cella right here that she, she had had. Very, very small opening. And so by just making a much wider opening, all that's dura now, uh, we could get a complete tumor removal. And here's an example of a sort of the, the double whammy, what we call the the tunnel vision effect. So this was a patient who had an operation. 
This is the post-operative film. This is an abdominal fat graft put where the tumor was removed. This is all residual tumor. When we went in, this is an intact sphenoid osteum. The midline keel is intact. Here's what they went through, through the, the first opening in the bone. And then when we got in and looked at the, um, the opening they'd done into the cella, this was the opening. This is the actual fat graft. So all this, this, all this out here was bone. So they tried to do the whole operation through this. Which was too small. Yeah. So... Like in my case, which was the size of a golf ball, I think you remember, right? Was that a larger opening? You had to make a larger opening to get it out, or because of the softness of it comes up in any case? Well, it helps to have a larger opening. And what we found in a lot of these tumors, as I said, in, in about 10% of these cases, the tumors are rather fibrous. But in this series, of the 30%, I think about 40% were fibrous. So if you have a small opening, plus you have a fibrous tumor, you're, you're not going to be, you have a pretty high chance of not being successful in terms of getting the whole tumor out. And so... Um, we were able to get a complete removal in a little under 60%. We removed most of the tumor within the cella. And you can see that the invasive tumors, there, some of the tumors were out in the cavernous sinus. We didn't do very well with those, but 86% had a total removal um, that were non-invasive. So it just makes the point that, that you got to do an, an adequate uh, exposure. So, And then, to get, again, you asked the point about which nostril we come from. So. You know, if the gland is pushed off to the right, we come from the right nostril to get more of this tumor and the same thing. Same you thing. Again, when you say invasive and non-invasive, invading what? Um, the actual gland itself or the... No, the say the, caver the cavernous sinus here. Like, See here the carotid artery mm -hmm. here and here? So sometimes the tumors get out beyond the carotid here. This is probably some cavernous sinus invasion here. Okay. So those tumors are very hard to cure. We can get most of that out but we often can't get all of it out. So this is just showing these two, two cases. In, in this particular case, we were able to get, to get the vast majority of that. You can't really see any tumor there. There may still be some, but it looks like a complete removal. Same, same in this one. But so very important to choose the right nostril, the correct nostril for the, for the approach, depending upon where the tumor is. And then we also use the endoscope a lot now, and the reason why, this is, this is an example of a meningioma sitting on top of the gland here, and we want to make sure that we got the whole thing out. Um, once in a while we get hematomas. Um, we've had a few of them, and usually they're these very big tumors, that, uh, such as a, a big tumor like this. This is a post-operative hematoma. All that. Someone we had to take back and reoperate on. How large is that tumor? It's over four centimeters. You know. My size, right? Four yeah. Four yeah. So there. Those are the ones where there's a lot of um, sort of raw surface area, and if you, and it's easy to leave a little tumor behind, and the tumor tends to bleed. So you gotta. Um, Got to get it really dry, and the the problem is that in those cases we usually get a small spinal fluid leak, and we have to we have to repair the floor. So then we sort of lock the hematoma in place. That's one of the if it, with a large tumor it's better not to repair the floor if you don't have to. But if we get a spinal fluid leak, we have to repair it. I remember the first thing you were asking when I came to. That was the first thing you asked me. Do you have a leak? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Kills that into all of our heads, <laughs> literally. Um, and then uh, avoidance of uh, new pituitary failure uh, after tumor removal. In the in the literature, probably on average, it's around two to six percent. And posterior gland failure, meaning permanent diabetes insipidus, uh, water diabetes, is probably on the order of two to five percent. For craniopharyngiomas, the, those are tumors that are often wrapped around the pituitary stalk. Are very hard to get those out completely without causing diabetes insipidus. Um, what is the insipidus? It's just it's a water diabetes. You can't concentrate your urine, and uh, you have to take a, a hormone. You have to take the, the 
hormone that's made by the posterior pituitary to, to correct that. And so it's not like it's not a sugar diabetes. So the way we avoid that is, you know, we, we obviously know where the normal gland's going to be uh, based on the MRI. Um, for instance, in this meningioma, it's pushed down here. These are the problems, these craniopharyngiomas, where it's very difficult, where we can't really see where the pituitary stalk is in the gland. The pituitary stalk is often engulfed by the tumor, and it's very hard. But even with, with some of these uh, large tumors such as this, where the gland is really thinned out, uh, this little thin crescent of gland can, can recover. And this is a person who had recovery of his low testosterone, his hypogonadism, that came back after the operation. So sometimes by just taking the tumor out, you can, you can make people better. Also, this is the video I was going to show you with the showing after the meningioma removal. There's that. That's the optic chiasm. And the pituitary stalk is here. The gland is down below. And we're getting a good look to make sure that we didn't leave any tumor behind. That's the beauty of the endoscope. This was our, our early experience. This is, goes back to 2003, showing that we had 21% of patients gained in axis, 6% lost in axis. We had transient diabetes insipidus in 25%, which means it went away, and permanent in 8% um, uh, of the adenomas. But these were a lot of very large tumors. Five of seven were giant adenomas, meaning they were over, they were over uh, four centimeters in size. And then 17% in the cystic tumors, like the cranial pharyngiomas. Um, this is a paper on Cushing's disease showing uh, basically that we really didn't have any new pituitary failure in that group with the exception of one patient where we took the entire gland out and the pituitary stalk because the patient had a very aggressive tumor that was growing up along the pituitary stalk. And so... Uh, in general, if you, if you, even if you take out half the gland, what we would call a partial hemihypophysectomy, we didn't have any new pituitary failure in those patients. And other people have found pretty much the same thing. Um, spinal fluid leaks, um, one of the recurring themes in neurosurgery. Um, they're really to be avoided because... Uh, they result in things like meningitis, what we call a tension pneumocephalus, where you have a lot of air inside the head, prolonged hospitalization. So we try to keep the uh, CSF in its, in its proper place, stay dry. Those are my two daughters. <laughs> not staying dry. What is the general amount of the usual length of time in the hospital after Two days. Surgery on Wednesday, usually home on Friday. Except the patients. They must go home on day two now. Day two? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Things are really getting better. I should have waited. <laughs> so um, we, we use a grading system for our spinal fluid leaks. So the, the grade one leaks, what we call small, none, no leak, or sorry, grade zero leaks with no leak, then there's small, medium, and large. The large leaks are typically only with the, when we take a brain tumor out, the very large defects in the skull base. Um, I'm not going to get into too many of these details, but here, here's just an example of how we use the collagen sponge. For instance, if this is, um, this is the tumor here that's taken out, then we put a layer of collagen here, and then we um, put this titanium mesh in place to hold that into position and then we put some more collagen over that. That's a sort of simple repair. doesn't involve a fat graft or lumbar drain. For the bigger leaks, we, we use uh, collagen sponge, plus we use fat. This, this bright area here, this, so this, here's the tumor. After the tumor's out, we put the fat graft in place, and we have the titanium mesh there, so there's fat in the, in the cella and also in the sphenoid sinus. And then over time, the fat graft tends to melt away. So a year later, it's gone. For the most part, it disappears. For these larger leaks, we use uh, that plus um, tissue glue, and we use spinal, spinal fluid diversion. And so here's our 
a little over half the patients get an intraoperative leak. Um, most of them are grade one leaks. And you can see that our failure rate is about two and a half percent. We've had three cases of meningitis. Everyone who's made a, made a good recovery. Do you, Dr. Kelly, do you find the CSF, uh, CSF leaks earlier because there's no packing? Well, we, we don't let people go home before we tip them. We make sure they're not leaking. And usually we get some sort of scan to make sure they don't have any intracranial air. If, we, if they had an intraoperative leak. So we look for it. And I think that's part of the reason our meningitis rate is so low, because we, we don't let people go home. We, we provoke the repair to make sure that they're not leaking. So um, this is really uh, more for residents and colleagues about complication avoidance. Um, obviously, we've got to learn from others' mistakes, anticipate the complications before they happen. And when they do happen, you should address them aggressively because wishful thinking will not make them go away. <laughs> Prepare the patient for possible complications. And admit and publish your own publications. It's refreshing and possibly therapeutic, not only for you, but also your colleagues and future patients. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
my mentor Ed Laws that are out there, you know, doing doing very good work, and they do maybe 20 or 30 cases a year, and they do a great job. So you just have to check it out. And, How many and a year do you have? Year. About 150, 160. We include Harbor. Yeah. I think one of the biggest problems that I see up there is not just that the surgeon, um, to the you know, a lot of the patients don't have a, a Dr. Kelly in their area. I mean, they're they're pretty limited to what their insurance will pay for and different things. But another part of the problem is there's a lot of bad information given out freely on the internet. And um, patients that don't have a support group like this or um, different things, I mean, they don't even know what, they're, what they don't know to ask is part of the problem. And many patients rely on their surgeon or their, or their endocrinologist or, or something to, to uh, be proactive and tell them that, you know, the biggest complaint I get is that people tell me over and over, well, why didn't my doctor tell me that? Well, because of the lack of experience with their own physician, the physician didn't know to even tell them because they just don't have enough, they don't see enough patients a year to even know these things. So that, that's really the biggest problem. I think also Dr. Kelly mentioned one time to me that it's the most misdiagnosed in the world, right? The pituitary tumor, anywhere. Misdiagnosed? Yeah. Well, it, it's, I don't know if it's the most, but it's, it's, it's common, uh, and particularly with the Cushing's patients, um, the diagnosis can be missed, or it, it's the one where people get it wrong the most, I think. Either they think they have Cushing's and they don't, or they do have Cushing's and no one diagnoses it for a long time. Yeah. Is an elevated 24-hour um, cell diagnostic Cushing's? No. That's part of it. But you, there's a, a lot of other things that, you know, need to kind of fall into place. Right. So, you know, you have to make sure the ACTH needs to be normal or high, and you need to have the 24-hour urines repeated. You know, you need to have a few of them to make sure that it's not just some spurious result. Um, in men, we're, we're always suspicious because, you know, 80% 85, in our experience, 90% of the patients with Cushing's are women. So in a man, we always, you know, we have to be, you know, just as thorough or more thorough to make sure because um, it's not that common in men for, for some reason. I don't know why. But with men, what I see is it accelerates a lot faster. Like the men that I finally see, they're, they're very sick by the time, and the bones are, are a huge problem being weak and osteoporosis and different things like that. Common in children too, as I understand, right? You know, or do you treat? Yeah, we some, but it, it's not it's not that common. No. I mean, but it, we we see some, yeah. Do they know what causes it? No. Uh, you know, the the thought is in most cases it's a it's probably a, a random mutation. Um, and you know, the the vast majority of these, ninety nine point nine percent, are benign. Pituitary carcinoma is extremely rare, you know, one in a thousand at the most, which is a good thing. Did Dr. Yeah. Cohen have a very technical explanation for that? Is that one cell just goes crazy? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's now Dr. Benjamin Cohen, mm -hmm. and he's your colleague. Mm -hmm. And between him and Dr. Heaney, I know this is a difficult question. They're both great. You go to either one. You'd be in good hands. Okay. And what about Theodore Friedman? Have you ever heard of him? Mm hmm. Unlike um, like, you know, it's a very frightening situation getting different opinions. Yeah. Not knowing who to trust. Well, I think you get two of the same. If you go to three and you get two of the same, you're probably okay. Yeah. yeah. You get three different ones. Like the <laughs> <laughs> what about Dr. Ahmadi? Sheila Ahmadi? Uh, she's in the she's here. Center, yeah, she's know. very good. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's good. I've read somewhere that pregnancy can trigger the development of the unknown. Is that true? I, I don't know if that's true. I, I don't know that there's any strong data to support that. So. In my case. <laughs> 
Wait and see. I don't know. There's no real data for it, but what I've noticed, um, may, you know, my suspicion is that may, the tumor was there. It was just. Just, it just it was not pregnancy. as aggressive and maybe during pregnancy or the hormones or something because I do get quite a few women that notice the Cushing's the Cushing's to accelerate right after a pregnancy that they didn't notice the symptoms mm -hmm. too much before. yeah well, I think that's true I, I someone should look into that um, actually. Sure. <laughs> well, because with, mine, with my first pregnancy I think it triggered it and with the second pregnancy you absolutely knew something was and that's when it expedited everything don't you it's usually very difficult to get pregnant when you're when you have Cushing so yeah. who's, who's to say I mean we don't know but um, but I have noticed that too because I didn't have difficulty getting pregnant it was just once I was pregnant it just seemed everything yeah. was moved along yeah. I think you had it there which didn't cover it, sinus infections how many people like me, get sinus infections after the surgery. Well, you know, we, we don't image everyone, but we probably give a prescription of Augmentin or something like that to almost 10% of people afterwards. And um, so, you know, it's what we would call empiric treatment. If you're complaining a lot, you're having a lot of congestion, you're having, we just, we, we treat you. And usually that, usually that works. Um, but not always, you know, but we've only had about two or three patients who we've actually had to send to the ENT surgeon to do a, a procedure, to go in and open something up. Um, if, for instance, uh, that, that middle turbinate, that little bone that we push out, we, we out-fracture, we actually fracture that bone out. And when we do that, it closes off the opening to one of the, the maxillary sinus right here. So at the end of the procedure, we have to push it back. But if it, for some reason, falls back, it can block that and you can get a, what's called a mucosal. You can get a bunch of col fluid collected in your maxillary sinus. So we always look for that on the post-operative images. But usually um, it, it clears up.